Have you ever heard of the Battle for Athens? It took place in December 1944. And then you may think, well, it's between the Germans and... Uh, no, the Germans by this time were gone. Soon after the Second World War came to an end here in Greece, the Greek Civil War started. And here on this square, the Battle for Athens started. It was also known as the Decemphriana. How that all happened, you will learn today. Keep watching. Hey, good to have you back on the channel. If you're new, I'm Stefan, I'm a Dutch history teacher and I like to cover history on location. Like I'm right now here on Sintakma Square in Athens, Greece. And if you find it interesting as well, consider subscribing. Also hit that notification bell. During the Axis occupation of Greece, Greek communists from the Greek Communist Party, the KKE, formed the EAM, National Liberation Front and their armed wing, the Greek People's Liberation Army, ELAS. Do notice that not only communists were in this formation, also socialists and republicans. Two significant other groups were EDES, National Republican Hellenic League, and EKKA, National and Social Liberation. In October 1944, the Germans started to withdraw and early November they were gone except with some small holdouts here and there. Preparations for Greece after the German occupation was over were made by the British. British Prime Minister Winston Churchill wanted King George II to return on the throne. The British, they appointed George Papandreou as Prime Minister. Papandreou was a fierce anti-communist and the British believed he would do. The new Greek government was named the Government of National Unity and it had done away with the remnants of the old Metaxas regime. But this is kind of strange, because looking at the king, the king was one of the architects of this Metaxas regime and supported it. So why would he return on the throne? And even more odd, the EAM's role in the new government was limited. But by the time the Germans left, the EAM and the ELAS controlled 90% of the Greek territory. Despite all this, the EM was willing to work with Papandreou and his new government. Six days after the German departure, 6,000 British troops and alongside the new Greek government arrived in Athens. Their control reached barely beyond the urban centers of Athens, Piraeus, Patras and Salonika. And in the meanwhile, reprisals and counter reprisals between resistance fighters and former collaborators took place. Politically, the issue that would soon turn into a lit fuse was how to reconstitute the country's armed forces. In the last months of 1944, the whole of Greece was awash with weapons. But at the time of liberation, the owners of these weapons were about evenly divided between those loyal to EAM, ELAS, and those opposed to it. And the situation got even more tense, especially since the Papandreou government had to rely on Greek police units which, during the occupation, worked together with the Germans. Negotiations followed, but they reached an impasse in November 1944. See, the Papandreou government wanted the ELAS and other guerrilla bands to be disarmed and absorbed into a new Hellenic army. However, this meant that communists, for example, had to follow orders from monarchists and even worse, former collaborators. They certainly did not agree with that. On the Peloponnesus, Macedonia and even in the outskirts of Athens, small-scale fighting broke out, but it soon got worse. Early December, EAM representatives in the government of national unity resigned and the KKE, the Greek Communist Party, set up headquarters here on Syntagma Square facing the Greek police office where many former collaborators were working and also on the opposite side was the Grand Bretagne Hotel where the British HQ was at. In other words, the battle lines were set here on Syntagma Square. The EAM announced a general strike and the government granted a request of demonstration which was later revoked. Thousands of people, one witness stated 60,000 showed up on this square. Armed police was present. Many of the protesters were women and children waving Greek and allied flags. However, there were also armed communists among them. At some point, 
two grenades were thrown from the crowd and the guards opened fire. People hit the ground to save themselves and in the ensuing shootout a dozen were killed and dozens more wounded. ELAS units started to attack police stations throughout the city, arresting and murdering officers they deemed traitors. Elsewhere in the country, they drove out EDES units. Its leaders were saved by the British. Historians have debated whether the ELAS attacks were planned or spontaneous. Historian Roderick Beaton says it was both and neither. The vicious war of the mountains had come to the capital, complete with all its practices of horrific violence that had been handed down from Ottoman times and the revolution of the 1820s. Here and in the provinces, the ELAS command, no less than the rank and file, was driven by the mentality of revenge and disproportionate reprisal that was the legacy of the occupation. The violence was mostly Greek on Greek, as the ELAS was reluctant to attack the British. Winston Churchill, who was personally interested in Greece, vowed to restore order and visited Athens late December. He ordered General Ronald Scobie, the commander of the British forces in Greece, do not hesitate to act as if you were in a conquered city where a local rebellion is in progress. We have to hold and dominate Athens. Men of a British airborne unit occupying a rooftop position fire down into the streets to prevent movement of Elas forces. The ancient buildings hold sudden death for the Greek warriors against whom General Scobie's forces have so regretfully had to take up arms learned guerrilla warfare in a hard school when they were fighting against their German oppressors. The fighting lasted a month and the British had to bring in substantial reinforcements. The 4th Indian Infantry Division was brought to Greece. By the third week of December, it seemed the British would get the upper hand. Meanwhile, the Greek national government was in shambles. The politically explosive question of the return of King George II was shelved. Papandreou had resigned and the interim prime minister became General Nikolaos Plathidas. We knew him from the successful military coup 1922 and the two failed ones in 1933 and 35, as he fears anti-communist. He wouldn't solve the conflict, yet the ELAS units were forced into the defensive. Their popularity also severely declined as they took hostages and later executed them while retreating. The hostilities ended mid-January and next month a peace agreement was signed, the Treaty of Arkiza. Article 6 required immediate demobilization of all armed forces under the control of EAM and the surrender to the state of all requisitioned supplies. The totals actually surrendered were more than was agreed, but less than ELAS possessed. Do notice that some historians point out this battle kicked off the civil war. It sure gave an impulse to it. However, back in 1943, armed confrontations between EAM, ELAS and EDES already occurred. The details of the Greek Civil War is something I want to leave for the future. If you're Greek, let me know how this conflict is remembered in your country. Thanks to my patrons who support me, their names can be seen right here. If you'd like to learn about the Greek collaborationist government, click here. And I mentioned the pre-war Metaxas regime, I did cover that in another video, click right here. As always, thanks for watching and best wishes from Athens, Greece.